Are you ready? Uno, due, tre. He was an original. In the history of motion pictures, no one before or since has seemed quite as debonair, as sophisticated, and yet, with it all, as human. For over 30 years, he was Hollywood's most sought after leading man, acknowledged as one of its truly great comedians. He was the star everyone loved. He was also the star few really knew. His name was Cary Grant. Cary Grant, this debonair Hollywood screen idol. His screen persona was not something he was endowed with, but something he made himself into. Made himself into the picture of style, charm, and sophistication. All the more remarkable since he was born into a lower class English family. Bristol, England today. There still stand the places he knew as a child, the street on which he was born, the school he attended, and most important, the theater that became his entranceway to the world. He was born January 18, 1904, Archibald Alexander Leach. His mother was Elsie Leach, a prudish Victorian. Her husband, Elias, worked hard as a pants presser and was rarely home. Pampered and immaculately dressed, Archie was the center of Elsie's life. But that would suddenly end. He was only 10 years old when he came home from school one day to find his mother gone. His father had her committed to a local mental hospital where she remained for the next 21 years. He was told she was gone for a rest, she would be back, but it was all very vague. And uh, he was then left with all these self-doubts as to whether he had been the cause of it. Why had his mother walked out on him? It was to have a, I feel, a profound effect on him for most of his life. He rarely saw his father and often went to the Bristol docks and dreamed of running off as a cabin boy. But then fate intervened for young Archie and a chance visit backstage to Bristol's Hippodrome Theater would change his life. It was like nothing he believed possible. The lights, the music. Archie got a job calling actors to the stage. It was magical. He saw the men and women who emerged from these dressing rooms transformed before an audience into performers. They were cheered, applauded, adored. It was an experience Archie would never forget. And he was hooked. Within weeks, Archie became a member of Pender's Knockabout Comedians, learning the art of pratfalls, stilt walking, pleasing an audience. Archie had found himself a new family. In two years, the Pender troupe would be on its way to perform in New York City, and 16-year-old Archie would be with them. New York was a far cry from Bristol, England. The Jazz Age was being born, and Archie reveled in it. When the Pender lads headed for home, Archie decided he had nothing to go back to. His chance for a future was here, and he was going to make the most of it. In 1929, he managed to get a screen test from Paramount Pictures. 
he was rejected. The reason? Bow legs and what was described as a thick neck. Archie refused to accept that verdict. My room died. My room died. My room died. Oh, boy, what a great day to have good eyesight. This short, Singapore Sioux, made in New York City, was the start of one of the great screen careers of all time. Hello, Judy. You're all by a doll. Save it for me. There it is. And a beautiful Chinese girl for you. It was 1931. Archie Leach was 27 years old and determined to succeed. He drove to Hollywood with all his possessions crammed into his first Packard and soon got another screen test. This time, Paramount gave him a contract and with it, a new name. Archie Leach would be no more. He was now Cary Grant. I'd heard the usual legendary stories about how Cary Grant became Cary Grant. Uh, for instance, I'd heard that he fashioned himself after Douglas Fairbanks and after Noel Coward with that elegant style. I think it started a different way. The first time I remember him making any impact was when he was Mae West's leading man. Now, Mae West being the powerful, powerful personality that she was, just obliterated anyone else who was on the screen with her. But apparently, she liked him. I should come up sometimes, see me. I'm home every evening. And he liked her. Yeah, but I'm busy every evening. And she gave him a pretty good room uh, in which to operate. You see, we're holding meetings in Jacobson's Hall every evening. Anytime you have a moment to spare, I'll be glad to have you drop in. You're more than welcome. And he had his own way of talking. And uh, it was so unique that it stamped him uh, as a personality. After she'd done him wrong, Cary Grant was acknowledged by Paramount as being among their more important leading men. On February 10, 1934, Grant wed the first of his five wives, Virginia Cheryl. What seemed to be the perfect Hollywood marriage didn't last long. One year later, Virginia Cheryl would file for divorce, accusing Carrie of extreme possessiveness. For Carrie, it would be a replay of the old feelings of being abandoned. For two years, Grant struggled as he was saddled with the minor and uninspiring roles that Paramount gave him. Finally, he bought out his contract with Paramount. He was the only leading man in Hollywood to go freelance. But his decision quickly paid off. In 1937, Carey signed on for the Hal Roach comedy, Topper and struck gold. But it was in Columbia Pictures' The Awful Truth, released the same year, that Carey's true brilliance as a comedian was established. From day one, it was a madcap production, largely because the director, Leo McCary, made it up as he went along. Grant's co-star, Ralph Bellamy, explains. McCary came in with uh, sometimes a piece of brown wrapping paper in his hand, and he'd say, you come in here, and you come in over there, and I'll run the dog through here, and then you come in or whatever. And that's the way we made the picture. We never had a script. Here's my husband coming along. Carrie caught on quickly. <laughs> well, hello, folks. Hello. hello. Uh, this is Dixie Bell Lee. This is Mrs. Warner, and this is Mr. Leeson, the gentleman that Mrs. Warner is going to marry. It was right in his groove, his kind of comedy, of humor. Now, uh, now you're sure we're not intruding? Uh, uh, what do you mean? He could laugh with you as you were watching him. He knew you were laughing, and he was encouraging it. Ah, uh, so you're going to live in Oklahoma, eh, Lucy? How I envy you. Oklahoma. We're going to live right in Oklahoma City. Lucy, you lucky girl. 
New York's all right for a visit, but, but I wouldn't want to live here. I know I'll enjoy Oklahoma City. But of course, and if it should get dull, you can always go over to Tulsa for the weekend. And he started to play this more and more comfortably, more and more comfortably, and of course, effectively. Take it. And by the time the picture was over, he had found a persona that he could cling to and make more and more his own. And then, of course, he developed into perhaps the brightest comedian on the, on the uh, uh, horizon. Then, Carrie had a field day playing opposite Katharine Hepburn in the zany 1938 Bringing Up Baby. Say, now, I just gave you my picture. No, 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 look, I'm just trying to tell you that you've told Oh, no, I didn't. Why, if you hadn't been in such a hurry that waited for my explanation, my coat. your coat would still be perfectly all right. <laughs> That same year, the Grant Hepburn magic was again at work in Holiday. Carey was hailed for his performance as a romantic who found himself engaged to the wrong sister. Don't worry about it, dear. If I'm going to get stuck with a rich girl, I'll just grit my teeth, make the best of it. Oh, but darling, you're going to make millions yourself. Oh, but darling, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no. I'm oh, not. yes. No. Is life wonderful where you are? Well, I don't call what I mean doing living. And what do you recommend for yourself, Doctor? A holiday. Follow. Well, as long as I need. You mean just a play? They want to know how I stand, where I fit into the picture, what it's all going to mean to me. And I can't find that out sitting behind some desk in an office. So as soon as I get enough money together, I'm going to knock off for a while. Quit? Quit. I want to save part of my life for myself. There's a catch to it, though. It's got to be part of the young part. With the Philadelphia story, in which he co-starred with Katherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart, Cary Grant established himself as Hollywood's foremost light comedian. But events abroad would change what brought people into theaters. And Cary Grant would have to find a way of adapting to that change. In 1941, with World War II raging in Great Britain, Grant became a US citizen. And with the nation's appetite for screwball comedies gone, Grant made a different kind of movie, Penny Serenade. What a grip. For a girl, I mean. The first time I saw her, she looked so little and helpless. I didn't know babies were so, so little. And then when she took hold of my finger and held on to it, she, she just sort of walked into my heart, Judge, and, and she was there to stay. I didn't know I could feel like that. I'd always been, well, kind of careless and irresponsible. I wanted to be a big shot. Look, I'm not a big shot now. I'll, I'll do anything. I'll work for anybody. I'll, I'll beg. I'll borrow. I'll... Please, Judge. I'll... I'll sell anything I've got until I get going again. I mean, she'll never go hungry and she'll never be without clothes, not as long as I've got two good hands to help me. For his performance, Carey received his first Academy Award nomination. He was searching for something, and I think that's what got him into the darker period, so to speak, of his life, with a picture such as Suspicion. But there wouldn't have been a suspicion with Cary Grant unless he could trust the man who was making the movie, Hitchcock. There was something strange about Johnny A's God. I knew it long before I married him. It was our first meeting on the hilltop. Now, what do you think I'll do, kill you? Nothing less than murder can justify such a violent self-defense. Even his reassurances seemed almost sinister. I want nothing but to spend the rest of my life with you. And if you were to die first, I... Hitchcock I saw in that face something besides a handsome leading man. I, th I think he saw in the face the potential to be menacing, to be uh, equivocal, to be mysterious. From that moment on, my life was filled with fear. Thought of Johnny, I loved him too much to really be afraid. But the fear of not knowing, the agony of waiting, Wondering how it would happen, waking in the middle of the night, shaking with terror, and finding myself praying that whatever it was, 
It would be done quickly and with mercy. In 1944, Carey risked the greatest departure he would ever make from his image, to play a character whose world could have been that of Archie Leach. The film was none but the lonely heart. Anything in the shop needs mending, Ma? Nothing that needs your help, Bernie Sweets. Carey was a man of infinite experimentation with his own character. Mean to do my best by you, my love. Happy couple, aren't we? He was constantly striving, it seemed to me, to become better. Peace. That's what us millions want. Not having to snatch it from the smaller dogs. Peace to be not a hound and not a hare. But peace with pride to have a decent human life. Unfortunately, the roles that he ventured out on, such as None But The Lonely Heart, were not his most successful pictures. And I think it made him step back a little bit from playing real character parts. Though critics praised None But The Lonely Heart, and he received his second Academy Award nomination, Carey measured success by box office results. And there, the film was a disappointment. During the war years, Cary Grant met, married, and divorced within a three-year period one of America's richest women, Barbara Woolworth Hutton. Undaunted by its failure, he was soon ready for another romance. During one of his frequent trips to Europe, Cary met an aspiring actress, Betsy Drake. Annabelle, do you mean you're going to deliberately set out to trap him? Well, I know it's dreadful, but this is the kind of thing men force us to do. Why have you been chasing after me for the past two weeks? You? Really, Dr. Brown, I've heard of conceited in my time, but you absolutely take the cake. And you'll know just how many candles go on it. Betsy Drake and Carrie were married the following year, 1949. Betsy was opening new worlds to him in philosophy and self-knowledge. And at last, he was able to fulfill his ambition. Together, they took tramp steamers to explore distant ports. And more than ever, the private Cary Grant seemed to resemble the image he had created on the screen. But if he wondered whether to enter permanent retirement, the question was answered by Alfred Hitchcock. The film was the 1955 To Catch a Thief. Who brought you up here? The police. And we would have caught you, too, if my dress hadn't gotten caught all over the steering wheel and gear shift. But it was only 20 minutes ago I said goodbye. As quickly as you could. Didn't I thank you? Politely. Well, then. Oh, John, you left in such a hurry, you almost ran. I had work to do up here. Were you afraid to admit that you just can't do everything by yourself? Gary liked his partners to be distinguished ladies. He chose always women who had a certain breeding. It was very important to him. I think he was very, very fond of uh, Ingrid Bergman and Grace Kelly. I guess I'm not the lone wolf I thought I was, Francie. Well, I, I just wanted to hear you say that. With the 1959 Hitchcock classic, North by Northwest, Cary Grant found the role that would let him be the man he always I'm wanted to be. I'm man, not a red herring. I've got a job, a secretary, a mother, two ex-wives, and several bartenders dependent upon me. And I don't intend to disappoint them all by getting myself slightly killed. Cary Grant, running for his life, searching for a man who doesn't exist, and a secret nobody knows, and finding a blonde who has all the answers. Hello there. Tell me, why are you so good to me? Shall I climb up and tell you why? I was fascinated by the combination of Alfred Hitchcock and Cary Grant because although they were very different in the facade, they were very classy gentlemen. Very classy. The moment I meet an attractive woman, I have to start pretending I have no desire to make love to her. 
What makes you think you have to conceal it? She might find the idea objectionable. Then again, she might not. Think how lucky I am to have been seated here. Well, luck had nothing to do with it. Fate? I tipped the steward five dollars to seat you here if you should come in. I just found him to be a very giving actor. And he, you, you just always felt that he was with you every minute, not only for his close-ups, but for your close-ups. I had the feeling that he was very happy I was working with him. And when he talked with me, I felt at that moment I was the only woman in the whole wide world. After a prolonged separation, Betsy Drake divorced Carrie in 1962. The marriage had lasted 13 years, and they would remain friends to the end of Carrie's life. By 1963, Carrie had enacted the role of leading man for over 30 years. Now, he was approaching his 60th birthday. One more time, darling. Where is it? Your husband was mixed up in something. What was it? Any minute now, we could be assassinated. Mr. Bartholomew! Mr. Bartholomew! Help me! Reggie, stop! Oh, I don't know who anybody is. Reggie, I beg you. Just trust me once more. Why should I? I can't think of a reason in the world why you should. When we made Charade, he was concerned that the age difference uh, between Audrey Hepburn and Carrie and himself was too great. Here you are. Where? On the street where you live. How about once more around the park? How about getting out of here? Come on, child, out. Won't you come in for a minute? No, I won't. I don't write, you know, unless it's called for. How would you like a spanking? How'd you like a punch in the nose? Stop treating me like a child. Well, then stop behaving like one. Do you know what's wrong with you? No, what? Nothing. And I thought Carrie and Audrey were as romantic a couple as you would ever find in a movie. I still believe that. I think the picture today, if you look at it, one of the joys is just those two people in that movie. Hey, you don't look so bad in this light. Well, why do you think I brought you here? I thought maybe you wanted me to see the kind of work the competition was turning out. Pretty good, huh? Mm. I taught them everything they do. Oh, did they do that kind of thing way back in your day? Sure. How do you think I got here? Not allowed to kiss back, huh? Oh, no. Doctor said it was bad for my thermostat. Come on, you come on, don't you? Well, come on. On July 22, 1965, Grant married for the fourth time. This time to actress Diane Cannon. Their daughter, Jennifer Grant, was born soon after. Grant said he always loved children. However, Grant and Cannon divorced only two years later. Walk, Don't Run was released the same year that Jennifer was born, 1966. But this time, Carey did not play the leading man. He had made 72 films, and this would be his last. He told me 
Look, I've produced Jennifer, the most marvelous girl in the world. What could compare with that? Certainly no movie. In 1970, Cary Grant received an honorary Academy Award for nearly 35 years of achievement. At last, the Academy was paying tribute to one of Hollywood's greatest stars. He no longer appeared on the screen, but even as he aged, the Cary Grant legend continued to grow. He joined the boards of major corporations. He addressed the 1976 Republican Convention. To introduce to you and to the nation, the president's first and our first lady, Betty Ford. He received one of his adopted country's highest honors, presented by an old Hollywood friend. Although at the time he ran off to be an acrobat, he was known as Archie Leach. Some actors had to change their names to become successful. Others didn't. <laughs> but always, it was the public Cary Grant on display. The private man still kept himself beyond reach. In 1981, he proved that in real life, he was still the leading man and could still win the beautiful girl. At 77, Cary married a young English woman, Barbara Harris. The extraordinary thing about Cary is that he became nobler looking in age. I'm not talking about handsomeness. I'm talking about the thing that's called soul. Cary Grant died on November 29, 1986, from a cerebral hemorrhage. He was 82 years old. And from Archie Leach to Cary Grant, what a giant step. And yet he became Cary Grant. He really became him. He sort of said, I actually have grown into the person that I wanted to be.